Kim, thank you so much for that. And joining us here in studio to discuss what we just saw and heard, we have two guests with us this evening. We have Andrea Shev and we have Caroline Heldman. It's great to have you with us. And Caroline, let's start with you. Your big takeaway from an hour and a half of a speech that we just watched. Well, I thought it was exceptionally disciplined for Donald Trump, perhaps. I, I would say, hands down, the most disciplined speech he's ever given. It was the launch of his 2020 campaign. Um, he, his uh, appeals to unity and bipartisanship at the beginning and at the end were really truncated in the middle with hyperpartisanship over immigration and abortion. So it was like hyperpartisanship with two slices of bread. A sandwich. Right. Kind of. A sandwich, right. if you will. A bipartisan so, happy for everyone, yeah. indeed. Uh, Andrea, what about you? What was your takeaway? I think there was a lot of really good feel-good moments in there mixed with actually very politically charged issues. For example, the wall, which has already been mentioned. But I do think that he incorporated somewhat both sides of the issue. I mean, he did talk about some of the elements of the smart wall, you know, technology, and at the same time, the physical barrier. So maybe we could hope that there's some movement in one direction or the other, and maybe we can look at... And he also mentioned, too, the positive side of immigration. There were some positives of bringing in more illegal immigrants and supporting the legal immigrants that are coming in. So there were some very positives, but there was mixed in some very highly charged topics. Well, I'd like to stick on this topic of immigration. I just want to give a note to viewers here that we are expecting uh, in a matter of minutes now to hear the Democratic response from Stacey Abrams uh, somewhere in an undisclosed location in Metro Atlanta. We'll bring that to you live as it happens. But let's talk uh, about immigration and even I think just the word choice, the word alien, which was used several times during this speech. Uh, Caroline, what does that signal to you because I know to many immigrants that word is in many ways almost a, a weapon of source. It's very harmful. It is. It's a xenophobic term and it is something that Trump used in order to ascend to power. Um, it fits with his narrative that we are to be afraid about what's happening at the border. But his, this national emergency and the idea that somehow our southern border poses a crisis is simply not borne out by the data, right? We actually have declining numbers of immigrants in the United States. We know that people who are here both legally and illegally immigrants have lower crime rates than people who are born here. Um, he shared a lot of myths about uh, immigrants taking from the system. And we know that uh, from several studies over the course of their lifetime, immigrants actually contribute $80,000 um, that they, they don't use in social services. And so he reiterated a lot of these myths and, and I would argue xenophobia in order to beat the drums of fulfilling his campaign promise for a wall, but it's never been based in fact. And if viewers are just tuning in and happen to miss out on the State of the Union, let's look back at an ex excerpt from uh, this evening's address where he talked about immigration uh, truly as, beyond anything else, a moral issue. This is a moral issue. The lawless state of our southern border is a threat to the safety, security, and financial well-being of all America. We have a moral duty to create an immigration system that protects the lives and jobs of our citizens. This includes our obligation to the millions of immigrants living here today who followed the rules and interesting to note there, we saw that last pan of uh, Senator Kamala Harris, of course, from Northern California, now presidential candidate uh, Kamala Harris, who I will also note has somehow, I imagine this is probably someone on her staff, uh, been tweeting throughout the evening didn't see on a number <laughs> of the topics. Yes, indeed. Uh, speaking out to some issues that hopefully we'll be able to get to this evening. But, Andrew, I'd like to turn to you in this whole notion that we've heard time and time again from the Trump administration that immigrants here in this country are criminals and that they are taking away from from resources what what sort of what does the data rather tell us about whether or not that is a factual assessment? Well, I think that there's a big misnomer that there is a lot of positive side of immigration. There's hundreds of thousands, if not millions, in the United States that are on actual visas that are actually contributing to society substantially. And what they have to go through to get those visas are a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of qualifications they need in order to get those visas. So I think it's, you know, it's hard to listen a lot because everything is so negative and everything is focused only on those criminals or the people that are killing people or the people that are murdering people. It's, there's a lot of immigrants that are coming in that are professionals, that are entertainers that we watch on the big screen every day. I mean, sure. that we enjoy and we spend lots of money to see. So it's, it's interesting to see why you know, everything is so negative based. But on the same token, 
um, President Trump mentioned a lot, in fact, in the speech, he said, I want people to come into our country, but they have to come in legally. But there's, you know, a lot of things he's saying is not actually playing out in the actual world of immigration. I mean, we have the longest process in times we've seen in a very long time. We have not enough professional visas available for the people that are trying to come in and work in the States or university kids coming out that are looking for jobs. You know, we have a lot of issues that are, you know, contrast to the reality of what's going on in immigration. And looking at through this lens of what this reality means for Southern California, Carolyn, I thought it was really interesting when he noted, uh, he, he talked about how illegal immigration really drains from the resources. And one of the areas that he mentioned was schools. And we just had recently here in Southern California a mass. We've got the second largest school district in the nation. We just are coming off the heels uh, of a teacher strike in which we saw a, a real strong solidarity with the immigrant students who were here in our schools. How do you think that's sort of a message that immigrants are draining from all of our resources, including our schools? How might that resonate with Southern California voters? Well, I don't think it resonates with us at all. In fact, we are a, a one of five states that are a majority minority state, meaning that we have more people, people of color outnumber white people in the state of California. 27% of residents in California are foreign born. So when he's talking about immigrants and he is calling them aliens and using that sort of language, he's really speaking to a, a majority of Californians. And I think that we don't appreciate this sort of rhetoric. We are very much in favor, if you look at, at polling, of uh, legal immigration, as you pointed out, Andrea. But we also are, are a sanctuary state. So this is a state that is much more progressive on this issue than Donald Trump. And his, his language and his rhetoric likely offended a lot of Californians. I, I would like to go back for a moment, Andrea. You mentioned just the process of immigration here in our country. I think it's very interesting to note of all the many words that we heard this evening, the word shutdown, I, I could be wrong, but I believe not mentioned once. And the federal government shutdown has had huge implications for the immigration process, entire courts that have been shut down. Can you explain, Andrea, what that actually means for people who are, yeah. who are trying to do just what we saw the president there asking for, go through the proper channels towards legal immigration? Yeah, during the shutdown, and I mean... It, oh, and it, I'm sorry, it looks okay. like we might be going to Stacey Abrams I'm sorry. We heard there from Stacey Abrams giving the Democratic response to the State of the Union address, and I really cannot think of a more diametrically opposed remark. And I have to say, Stacey sounded like she could have been delivering that address right here in California, even though she is somewhere in Atlanta. Uh, Caroline, your takeaway from what we just heard there and, and her approach to her view of the world. Well, she definitely pointed out some of the things that didn't come up in Donald Trump's speech, right? So she talked about marriage equality, but LGBT people uh, being under attack the Republican tax bill, which we didn't hear about, and of course will affect Californians, especially because we no longer have, this is the first year, we no longer have the exemption, the exemption for state and local taxes. She also talked about voting rights. So a lot of the issues that Donald Trump glossed over, but perhaps most importantly, she said the shutdown was a stunt. She brought that issue up. She talked about putting kids in cages. So kind of filling in the areas that Donald Trump just glossed over in his State of the Union. Uh, and Andrew, let's talk for a moment about immigration. There, we heard Stacey Abrams saying America is made stronger by the presence of immigrants, not walls. What does that say to you? Yeah, I think that she made a clear point saying that, you know, this country is built on immigrants. But I think that, you know, we still have a national security issue that she kind of sidestepped a little bit. And I think that we still need to come to a resolution of what to happen at the borders. So even though I think I really appreciate her putting forth the positive side of immigration, which we were just talking about, and that this country is built on immigrants, and we need to have respect for the immigrants that are in this country and have a proper avenue for the ones trying to get into the country. A wall, is it, is it the resolution? Is it, the, is it what we need? And I think that that's what she highlighted in her speech. I think. And one of the biggest contrasts, I think, that would be of great interest to, to many of our viewers here in Southern California is if you compare what uh, President Trump had to say and what Stacey Abrams had to say about about reproductive rights. Caroline, can we talk about that for a moment? Because that, that was a very stark contrast. Very stark contrast. So Donald Trump brought up the late-term abortion bills that have been passed in Virginia and New York. Um, he used a lot of the uh, you know, not based in fact ideas about what these bills mean and how often this happens and the conditions under which they happen. But Stacey Abrams pointed out, you know, a very stark uh, contradiction, if you will, in that he talked about, Donald Trump talked about children born and unborn, but 
he's putting children in cages at the border and ripping families apart as part of a planned policy of this administration. And so not all children are created equal in the eyes of Donald Trump. Andrew, care to weigh in on that? Well, I think that you know there's a there's a difference between one issue and the other, um, but I do, do think that there needs to be a humanitarian aspect of what happens at the borders and what happens with children and women that are coming in. I think that there needs to be more focus on that, and we need to look at that a little closer once we move towards, you know, revamping or reorganizing our immigration system as a whole. And, and I do think I know we're talking a little bit about the contrast here. There were just going back to a moment for uh, the president's remarks. There were a number of moments where we actually saw, dare I say, a, a little bit of coming together and some levity. Uh, there were some moments in particular where he talked about the, the number of women in Congress. Uh, Caroline, I'm just curious to your take on that, and let's not forget that sea of white that we saw there, all of the women uh, kind of showing in their fashion statement what large numbers they have now. Uh, can we talk a little bit about that moment, their chant of USA, USA? Right, which I think was an idea of reclaiming USA to say, well, yes, Democrats also believe in patriotism and, and nationalism in our country, but in a very different way. And in fact, Stacey Abrams brought that up as well. It, there were many moments where Donald Trump gave, uh, I think, the, a lot of folks the warm fuzzies, um, you know, beyond his, his exactly playfulness with the women wearing white. Um, also, Buzz Aldrin, the World War II vets, the Holocaust Who we should survivor. mention, Buzz Aldrin, a, a Los Angeles local, has a star on the Hollywood would walk of fame. Nice yes. to have a little local shout out there. And he talked about the beaches of California. I just wanted to bring that up. Yep. For someone who's not had a whole lot of love for the state, he did have some kind of, he highlighted some of our best parts, our golden beaches. He did. We were <laughs> cheering. Oh, California's part of the union. Yay. Um, you know, and the, and the child cancer survivor and the singing of happy birthday. I mean, this was really, this was a remarkable speech in many ways yeah. um, in terms of, of really unifying the chamber in at moments that we have simply never seen in the Trump administration or during his two years in office. Although I think many could say there is what is said in, in front of everybody there who was gathered and, and, you know, the country and perhaps the world watching. And then it will be interesting to see what will be the first tweet from right. here on out, <laughs> right? Or how Which, it all plays out as, you know, as we move forward. Policy actions, wise. the actions, right? Yes. Right. And can you talk a little bit more about that and what actions specifically we could see from this administration uh, that, that might possibly affect, especially those of us living here in Southern California? Well, I think that we need to see a lot of reform with immigration. I mean, as I've said numerous times, we need to move forward into a way of allowing more access to visas and more access to avenues to become residents and citizens in the U.S. He didn't talk at all about DACA. DACA is a big issue that he didn't even touch on, and he's always dro dropped it here and there about giving it as kind of like a carrot to the Democrats in order to create his wall. He didn't bring it up, and I think DACA is one. The Dreamers need a path to citizenship or a path to residency, and that's been kind of on the table quite a bit, but it's never been you know, resolved. It's kind of always thrown out there and then pulled back and then thrown out there and pulled back. And I think that we also Keeps need us to... on our toes. Yeah, I, I'm just going to interrupt you for one moment because we do now have uh, joining us live is Congressman Ted Lieu of California's 33rd district, which encompasses most of West Los Angeles. It's such a pleasure yeah, to have you with line. us and, and curious uh, your thoughts on tonight's remarks. Uh, thank you for your question. I thought there were some good parts to his speech and some bad parts. I am pleased that Donald Trump talked about two subjects that Democrats had talked about all last term. One was reducing health care costs. The other was investing in infrastructure. I think we can work with the president to move America forward on those two issues. I'm very disappointed that the president seemed to threaten that if we somehow did investigations, that he would no longer work with us. I think that's absolutely the wrong approach. And we took an oath as members of Congress to the U.S. Constitution, and we have a duty to conduct oversight of the other two branches of government. And Congressman Liu, just in case people are, are curious and are just tuning in now, we actually, I believe, have an excerpt of that speech where the president remarked on uh, the nature of the investigation going forward. Let's see if we could take a look at that. And we'll be with us just in a few moments. We'll ask for your patience on that as we bring up. And here we go. Let's take a look. An economic miracle is taking place in the United States. And the only thing that can stop it are foolish wars, politics, or ridiculous partisan investigations. 
So there we hear their ridiculous partisan investigations. Uh, Congressman Liu, I was watching your Twitter feed because it's always good for a Democratic response. I know you've been busy, but what, as you heard that, what went through your mind? Uh, that, first of all, the president seems scared of these investigations. And they're not going to be investigations that are done in an improper way. We want to do it before the American people. There'll be open hearings. We're going to call in witnesses under oath. We'll subpoena documents and we'll ask the appropriate questions. And hopefully, through all of this, the American people can see what happened. And it's with a view that either it's going to exonerate the president or it's not. But we do have to conduct these investigations. It's our duty as members of Congress. And, and you mentioned infrastructure, which I think everyone thought we'd hear a lot more about. And it, it was a very quick and brief mention. What specifically do you think we can and should be looking for here in Southern California when it comes to an investment in our infrastructure? Exceptional job. Uh, last term, I introduced an infrastructure bill that was $2 trillion. Even some of my own colleagues thought that was too much. But then, if you remember, last year, Donald Trump came before Congress, talked about infrastructure, and put a price tag of $1.5 trillion. So I think we're within the ballpark. I was a little disappointed he didn't talk more about infrastructure, but I'm just glad he talked about it. So I think we can work together to try and move forward on that issue for Americans. And specifically in California, I also worked together with members of Congress in both aisles and got full phase one funding for MTA to build out its light rail and subways. And I think it's important that Congress continues to work together to provide infrastructure needs, regardless of what state or city it is. We look at the actual need. Democrat Ted Lieu represents California's 33rd district. We thank you so much for your time this evening. Just a few seconds left on the clock, but uh, I would love to put to each of you, just if you have one quick thought to lose, what are you looking for tomorrow from the president? Resolution and movement forward. Perfect. Caroline, how about you? I would love some consistency. I like this, this new Donald Trump better than the one who typically shows up on Twitter. Um, let's see how long he can hold this facade. Well, the clocks are running. It's nearly 8 o'clock. And please do not forget to check out our dedicated webpage, spectrumnews1.com forward slash, forward slash rather, S-O-T-U. Good night.